I hope you're enjoying your time so far. I'm Rufaid Al Hamidi, and I'm bringing the new guests here with us. Our next session will be titled "Pursuing the Big Picture." The session will explore different aspects of giving and how it positively impact the giver and give him sense of fulfillment. Let's all welcome our coming upcoming moderator, Muad bin Jafan. And let's extend a, a warm welcome to our special guest of the day, Denise Shannant. Hadia Ghalib. And Ma'ata Samil Aulagi. Enjoy. Yeah, I think my, uh, my mic already set. Uh, hello, everyone, and good evening. Uh, sadly, it's the last day of MGF. I don't know if this is, should be a sad session, but we're trying to see the... Sad AM. No, 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 we're, do, we're, doing, we're doing something different here right now, so I'm not sure about this. But uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, in this session to talk about uh, pursuing the big picture. Uh, usually, when we cut up in our daily life and our uh, work and our business, we get lost uh, into uh, materials, into uh, having those kind of possessions. So today, we're going to talk beyond that. We're going to look for something beyond that and to see what is the meaning of things beyond uh, possession. And I'm glad and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to host uh, all the ama amazing uh, panelists as has been introduced uh, to talk more about their experience and to talk about more about their uh, uh, journey uh, building their business and building as well the uh, uh, journey that they have in a personal and a professional level. So, uh, hi, Denisha. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? So I'm going to start with you uh, and, and let's explore more. Uh, with your experience in leaf culture, could you share how sustainable practice uh, can lead to a giving back to the environment? So we want to hear more about your story in leaf culture. Okay, so I think let's unpack sustainability. So by definition, sustainability would refer to a practice that can carry on at a consistent rate for a very long time. Um, and so when we tie that into how we interact with the environment, this relates to practices that are conscious of how they impact the environment, the communities around them. And in essence, sustainability is then regenerative and restorative. And so my company, Leaf Culture, um, is there to generate or foster a culture that is regenerative and restorative, and in essence promotes um, practices that are sustainable and therefore are environmentally sound. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. And uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit of exactly what you do in Leaf Culture and what is the uh, main aspect of, uh, of your uh, company? Okay, so I mean, we do a few things. Um, the main focus is to mediate between government um, in South Africa, where I'm from. I, I work as a sort of a mediator and facilitator between national government, local government, community stakeholders, uh, funders, um, and then youth as well. So integrating all of those stakeholders in the same, into one project and getting them on the same page so that we can have more integrated, more interdisciplinary approaches to managing social environmental issues on the ground. So that's one aspect of what we do as a, as, as a company. The other aspect is communications and environmental education. So a big part of making sure that implementation and um, sustainability is impactful is being able to communicate it effectively. And so we generate content that reaches youth, that reaches government, that reaches funders. Um, and so generating a language or creating a language that people are able to understand at different levels um, and are able to comprehend the same vision or um, yeah, concepts around sustainability. So speaking different languages to different audiences and, and generating content around that. And then the other aspect of what we do is restoration. So one of our global goals is to restore a, a huge amount of, of our ecosystems. Um, it's called a 30 by 30. Uh, by 2030, um, 
we have restoration targets globally, and South Africa is one of the countries that have got on board with that. And so my company um, is dedicated to restoring landscapes, indigenous vegetation, indigenous ecosystems, water systems. Um, and so we do this by facilitating communities and helping them to um, create structures where they can work with local government structures in order to implement restoration and meet those goals. So small scale, but feeding into global goals. Amazing. So, yeah. Amazing, which is uh, what we were looking for when you're talking about the huge impact that came after that, uh, focusing in, in entrepreneurship on the uh, aspects of environment and how we make it, make it uh, sustainable. So thank you, Denisha. Uh, Denisha is the managing director of Leaf uh, Culture, uh, an amazing project, if I'm going to call it, or a company. So let me move to our second panelist, an amazing panelist, uh, Hadia, Hadia Ghalib is the CEO and founder of Hadia Ghalib Brand and uh, 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 Ghalib Production House. So let me just ask you, Hadia, starting from a social uh, or solving a social challenge to create a brand line, uh, we want you to talk about, about this journey and how did you start it and why did you start this journey? Okay, so just a background, just to give some context. So I'm an influencer. I have like 5 million followers across multiple social media platforms. And I've always dune, known that uh, I wanted to start a brand. I, I felt like this was going to be the next step for me. But the idea, but the, 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 the problem was, what should I do? Everything has been done. Abayas have been done, sunglasses have been, everything has been done. Mm. And then at the same time, um, in Sahel or in North Africa, in many luxury resorts, we would have every year a scandal. Mm. Every year, a woman who is wearing the burkini, okay, um, you know, the, the burkini, that, the normal one, she would go and she would get kicked out of a luxury resort. Uh, she would get bullied, she would get mocked at because she doesn't look nice, mm. she doesn't look cool. Mm. So, and, I, and what happened was at this time, I was with a friend and my friend was veiled and she was wearing the, the black burkini and, um, and we were going to a luxury resort and um, she got kicked out, and I was with her. So she was like, Hadia, do something. Uh, make a scandal on social media. You have 2.5 million followers on Instagram, do something. So I was like, even if I do something, every year it happens, and there's a scandal, it goes big, and then nothing happens. And this was when I got the idea, if I have a platform, if I have, so you needed three things to make it happen. You needed a platform that can change public opinion. So basically, to someone to say, no, burkini could be cool, they could be trendy. It's not just bikini that is cool, no, burkini, being modest, being, being an Arab modest woman is cool. Mm. So you needed someone to adopt this idea first and this someone needed to have a platform. Mm. So if I was just a small brand with 100 followers, even if I did an amazing product, an amazing design, it would not change anything because I don't, it, you don't have the platform. So the first thing you needed, a platform. The second thing you needed was financial capabilities. So I had saved money. I didn't take any money from, from my family or anything. I had saved my own money because I had a marketing agency before it for 10 years. So you had, so the idea was if you go with 100 products, it will not make an impact. You needed to go with, with 5,000 5, units, 10,000 units to make an impact in the market. And this is what I did. I took a risk, like 80% of my savings, I put it in this project. And you needed someone who doesn't care about their brand equity. I'm already bullied. People say I have big ears. People say I'm uh, ugly. People say I'm a, I'm a silly fashionista. I'm stupid. So I don't really care if I get bullied mm. because, for example, another brand who makes the black burkini, an international one, would be scared to do a colorful one, a nice one, because people can say this is not Islamic, this is not blah, blah, blah. Mm. But I didn't have a problem because I'm already bullied. So these were the three things. And when this happened, the whole idea was, okay, I want to make a product, but this product will really add value to my, to my, to my society, to my community. It will really add value. I t I'm taking the risk. So I could, have just made, I could have just made sunglasses or I could have made shoes and they would have sold mm -hmm. easily. But I took uh, a difficult product 
like the Burkini, where you have to work twice as hard. You have to change first public opinion, and then you market the product. Amazing. So it was double the risk, but double the reward. I got double the reward. We sold out in, 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 in two months. We, we, we did a lot of great things very quickly because the idea was to help someone, was to help my friend, was to help the friends of my friends to do something that is new that will help them. Amazing, amazing. And, and, and this, is, this is when we talk about, uh, and you mentioned it uh, uh, very clearly, that you could have done anything. You could have done sunglasses, shoes, and you could have done anything, and it will be sold. So uh, having the social mindset and understanding the reality and understanding the need for the social aspect is very important. And this is what we, when we talk about pursuing the big picture. So uh, uh, it's an amazing work to, to develop something like this uh, in order to solve a challenge or social, uh, social uh, challenge. So uh, moving to Mutasim, Ahlan Mutasim. So uh, I believe uh, uh, it's an important thing uh, uh, for a person, even for our well-being, to travel and to have the mindset of a traveler and people enjoy the experience of traveling. But I'm going to ask you in a different way. In your uh, journey with Nomohab, how does giving back contribute to a sustainable industry when, when it's come to tourism? Absolutely. First of all, assalamu alaikum all. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Maad, for, uh, for the question. Um, so yeah, so so giving um, giving is is not through one travel. Giving is a lifestyle that we live in on a daily basis. Giving is part of our religion. Giving is part of our culture. Giving is always part of us as human beings. And giving should not be viewed as something that is burden. It's something that we have to do to for others. Now, giving is an enabler for our growth. Giving is an enabler for all our businesses as well. And so to come back to your questions and to not divert from the view is uh, how does giving support in the sustainable tourism? So, for example, Tom's Shoes. Tom Shoes, when they started and they gained all the tractions, they started with the concept of what? You as a customer, you will buy one pair of shoes and we will donate one pair of shoes to underprivileged kids. Amazing. And this is, as us in the Middle East, we didn't know that it actually it had that value. And this is how it really gained all the traction. It started just by having the giving aspect, and that giving is the reason for its growth now. Mm -hmm. Now, Tom's shoes have a valuation of almost, what, $700 million at the moment, and they would not have actually reached that valuation without that giving. So think about the revenue growth that they have reached. Think about the impact that they have provided, which shoes has a massive, massive impact in, uh, in the underprivileged kids. Maybe we see it as a small thing in, in our... Uh, fortunate DCC environment, but if you go to Africa, actually, or you go to too many underprivileged uh, communities, regardless of whatever continent is, uh, shoes is really something that we take for granted. Not everyone has that access to it. And so back to your question, uh, giving is an enabler for their growth. Now, similar mindset or similar kind of approach to what Numuhab or what was the trigger of Numuhab. So uh, when I started in Mohab, I was like, I had that passion for travel, and uh, I wanted to do something different. So I decided to go for a six months solo backpacking trips. And I went through Africa, and I went through Kenya, and I went through uh, Europe as well, and I went through India. And one of the main things that I learned were I volunteered in a refugee, a refugee camp in, in Greece. And uh, during that period, we have seen so many people actually flood from, from Africa mm. for a better life, obviously. Mm. And you have seen really the struggles. And one of the kids actually fled from Iraq uh, during the, the, the ISIS time. And then they went through the, the whole journey of, of making it to Europe. And he was really full of hope. And I was like, whoa, if I, I was at 20 at that time and I was like if I was actually in his position would I really still have the hope that he has wow. and this little things you really start appreciating uh, you start appreciating the meaning of life you start appreciating things that you really have taken for granted mm -hmm. and this is really what shapes your character and this is what really makes you grateful for every single thing that you have and obviously grateful for the blessings so back to the question as well how Numuhab does it for the sustainable environment if you look at the market size of tourism as a whole us GCC travelers alone, we spend abroad almost what fifty billion dollars. Oh, so we're wow. talking about two hundred billion real Saudi. It's a whole uh, GCC travelers yep. abroad, yeah. Uh, and this including all the luxury travels, whether to London, Paris. And if you look at the market size now, or where we fit, uh, there is very limited sustainable tourism aspect. And the youth, or or the the, the which is constituted of a big market of our Middle East 
is they really want a meaningful travel experiences. They want something that really gets back to them. They want something that adds value to them. They don't want to be just a consumer. They want to be actually a giver at the same time they are a consumer, which is the same ex journey experience as you go through Tom's shoes. You want to buy a pair of shoes at the same time, you want to make sure that part of that money goes to help someone else and being a conscious uh, customer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Numohab started with that aspect. Uh, all our travel products, we started in Zanzibar, then we expanded in Nepal and different destinations. We make sure that every travel actually has a giving aspect to the communities we travel to. So we're not just a selfish uh, tourist, we are yet uh, uh, a provider to the communities we travel to. Amazing. And yeah, that's, that's how we contribute I, to the sustainability. I, I, I strongly believe in just what I shared with, the, with the, uh, diff our different panelists, that it's, it's, it's that meaning behind it. It's what make it unique and make it different. That it's not just about, you, ca you could have done, let's say, a travel agency and uh, could have worked uh, perfectly. But at the same time, giving that kind of meaning and, and the target audience that we're targeting, you give uh, uh, the sense of value to, to, to traveling and how do you do traveling. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going back to, to Denisha. So, to go in a more of a personal uh, level, uh, can you share a personal experience uh, where giving made a profound impact, uh, either in your professional life or uh, in your personal life? Yeah, well, I, I had to think about this for quite some time. Um, I think the, it will be personal and professional because I think they overlap with the work that I do. Um, so I have dedicated the last five years to a grassroots uh, project in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, in a very disadvantaged uh, area. It's surrounded by communities that have really harsh socioeconomic circumstances. In Cape Town, we have things like gangsterism, alcohol, substance abuse, so it's, it's rife, um, and it's all linked to poverty. Um, but in our constitution, um, every South African has a right to safe, clean, green spaces. It's a basic human right. Uh, unfortunately, in these communities, that's not necessarily possible or a priority when it comes to governance. Uh, I'm sure our government would like to make it a priority, but capacity is just quite limited. And so I, five years, six, five, six years ago, um, I was offered an opportunity to take on a socio-environmental project to restore a, one of the largest freshwater systems and biodiversity areas. I mean, I would relate it to a nature reserve or, or a national park. I don't know what, what it's called in Saudi, but an environmental space, yeah, a right. protected conservation area. So I took on this project. And I mean, I was quite young. I was working for a national institution, agricultural institution, doing amazing work. I also worked for um, really amazing MPOs before that. Um, and so, I mean, I came in with a bit of a chip on my shoulder because I had all this experience. But this somehow, this really triggered me, this project. Um, and I mean, it speaks to my values. You mentioned it, you know, at the core of all of us, our religion, our culture, giving is there. So when you give, you receive, and it's just something we grow up with. And so when I was presented with this opportunity, it was really personal. And I had to put a lot of my professionalism, my degree, my connections, the glamour, all of that aside, because this space was frowned upon in the environmental sector. Um, it wasn't seen as a priority area um, because the locals were living there, you know, it wasn't very glamorous. And I took it upon myself to make sure that the site, which is Princess Flay, uh, would be put on the map and that people would recognize this as a potential, a site that has the potential to be a heritage site, number one, to be a conservation area, to be recognized and receive funding um, as a conservation area. And just to get investment from and buy-in from, from local government structures, uh, structures and investors. And I can tell you after five years um, and, you know, going through this insane amount of, of ridicule and criticism, not being taken seriously because I'm working in a space that conservationists, I mean, my background is in conservation biology uh, and plant chemistry. And these people telling me, well, this is low priority, you know, this is, this is not worth saving. We, they were going to build a shopping mall there. It was, was aimed at development. And um, it just wasn't worth anything. And so I literally sat down 
just like you, I took on the bullying and I thought, you know what, we all go through this. At some point in, in our lives, uh, we are resilient people and I can manage this. And I stuck it out and today, this is a provincial heritage site. The cultural aspect of the site has been recognized. It's a biodiversity agreement site. We have a full restoration management plan, environmental management plan, and we have an amazing structure between ourselves, the local government, and various stakeholders. We have investment from foreign investors. Uh, you know, our funding is on repeat every three years. We have a massive um, charitable trust that has injected money into this. And it was a huge sacrifice. Um, and it was extremely impactful. And it laid the path for leaf culture. Uh, Leaf culture is, is about thinking about these spaces. It's about including these spaces just as much as we include the glamorous spaces, the touristy destinations. Princess Flay is now being considered a tourist destination in Cape Town, which is amazing. It's going to generate income and further opportunities for locals. And so it was excruciating in the beginning, amazing. but it was so impactful. And I think the results speak for itself. I think as well, uh, this is a collaboration opportunity with, uh, with Martinson. Of course. So we're talking about I, uh, yeah. Yes, and I, and I thought about that. I mean, this is a great opportunity. It's, a, it's an indigenous heritage site. You know, it's a religious heritage site as well. So it would be amazing. Exactly. And, and, and this, is, uh, this is where we're talking about that it's self-driven. And it's something came from something that you believed in and something that uh, uh, led you to, to, to build this project and to work uh, to save uh, uh, this specific uh, uh, place. So, uh, uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to do some marketing here. There is an ama amazing TikTok you can find on YouTube about this story. So you should, uh, guys, uh, watch it. Uh, it's, it's amazing Thank to talk you. about the story. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, going to you, uh, uh, Hadi, that we had a lovely conversation uh, before this session. Uh, that talk about your journey and building that in the experience. So I'm going to do the same question that uh, uh, y if you could share with us a personal or a yeah. story or experience that had this impact when, when you think uh, with the mindset of giving, how does that affect your professional or your personal life? Yeah, so I'll tell you a story. I think uh, a lot of people, you know Marasi in, Nor in uh, Sahel and North Coast. So I, I remember I was, uh, the first year I launched the brand, I was walking in, uh, on the beach and I'm seeing people wearing the, wearing the swimsuits. Mm. So I go to them, I take pictures, I take stories, I post them. And so they actually, they, they look for me so that I post, I post them. <laughs> so uh, it, it became like a tradition. And whenever I see anyone from my, from, my, from my customers wearing it, I would do a photo shoot with them and I would post it. Anyway, for the first time I see a man from far, man like, like I think 60 years old, old man, like same as my father, coming to me and very happy. I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> what does he want? <laughs> very weird, like usually women talk to me. <laughs> so, so he's coming to me, he's like, you're Hadja. I'm like, yes, <laughs> you changed our lives. I'm oh. like, no way, how? Mm. For the first time, mm. my wife who is 60 years old, she goes to the beach and she swims with me wow. after we're married for 40 years. Wow. wow. This is amazing. She's like, he's like, this is the first time we actually come and enjoy the beach and enjoy the summer. And we made memories today thanks to you and thanks to your product. And she feels confident and she feels happy. Wow. And this, chain, this made me so happy because they were the, the 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 happiness in his eyes was real like i felt it and for me this was better than million followers better than a million likes better than million dirhams doesn't matter that i made a change in a family's life and i saw them like uh, with their grandkids in the sea and like building sand castles and the lady wearing my product and she's very confident and she's very happy so yeah, this was one. Uh, this, is, this is this is amazing, and like you said, this it's uh, it's a so social challenge, mm. and this, at the same time you thought about it from your own background, and it's not something that you cre you have uh, let's say created from uh, a different culture, or a different background. It's from your own background. Yeah. So understanding the reality and understanding people, this is what show how great of an impact that uh, made. So this is this is truly truly amazing to uh, to be appreciated. So uh, going back to you, uh, uh, um, Mustafa. 
for the same uh, uh, question, uh, and I believe uh, uh, Noam Ham is a full with stories and experience that led to create this kind of impact. So could you share uh, what happened to you as an impact from building that uh, organization? So yeah, um, so one of the stories that actually touched my heart, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was traveling to Kenya, right? And uh, I was uh, volunteering in one of them uh, underprivileged uh, schools, and it was, it was uh, done in an orphanage uh, center. And every day we will be teaching in the morning because they have lack of teachers as well, and they don't have the. the and that was just teaching English and, and uh, basic maths. So uh, one of the things that I noticed is uh, the kids. Uh, they will be provided food during lunch break, and we will be with them. And this is this was one of the very tough slum areas actually in Kenya. It's a very very uh, very. It's very underprivileged community, I would say. And the kids, they would always every single day they will have beans or rice. Every single day for lunch, they will have either beans or rice. Mm -hmm. And I was confused. I was like, do they, do, they, do they have any meat or do they have any chicken? And then uh, until uh, I asked one of the, the kids there, and they were like in, uh, between 6 to, uh, I would say between 6 to 12, and he was 12, 10 years old, yeah? Oh, yeah. And I asked him, uh, do you guys have like any chicken? Silly question for me. Like I, like, I shouldn't be asking that question, but it came out for me. <laughs> I was like, he told me, I've tasted chicken once in my life, and wow. it was so tasty. And that moment I was like, because he could not afford having chicken again. Ten years old, he could not have a chicken or meat in his life and had been eating beans and rice. And this made me really reflect here. And he's like, we, we, have, we take every single thing for granted. Mm -hmm. We have every single thing that we wish for. And uh, so many people around the world that absolutely have uh, none of what we have. And we're really fortunate as well mm -hmm. in the GCC. For to have the the, the, the the environments that actually uh, yeah we're grateful for. So yeah, back to your questions. This really has uh, touched my heart. It opened up my eyes to something that uh, I was really uh, uh, unawake for, I would say. Mm. And uh, this little experiences that really shape the characters. Mm. You start you start time conscious. You start uh, developing your skills. You start uh, being. Uh, well aware of your spending habits, you know, you're not, uh, you start, you start developing a lot of skills that comes naturally yeah. uh, later on. But yeah, and this it's, it's, it's amazing uh, that you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that because, uh, uh, and taking things for granted, because mm. uh, uh, this is one of the things that uh, we might not, we might forget uh, when we, uh, we, we enter the market and we start to do in our business, that's what exactly, why am I exactly doing this and why am I exactly working here or there? Uh, what is the meaning of that uh, uh, for you? So this is, uh, I think it's a time for reflection on something. But yeah, we're not encouraging anybody to quit today. We're just yeah, saying that it's me to reflect, reflect it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to st yeah. You, you, you I don't just want to add uh, one thing. Absolutely. And when you go through th things like this, you reflect and you see with all the hardship that we think we're having, right? With all the challenges that we're facing, yeah. with everything that we go through, these are nothing. This is our dreams exactly. for other people, exactly. you know? Mm -hmm. Like what we think is actually a, a, a big challenge or as, as something that is killing us or something that we wish we didn't have. These are dreams for so many people around the world. Exactly. And this by itself is, 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 is an eye-opening for so many opportunities. It's an eye-opening for a lot of things that uh, you're just unleashing out of your brain, yeah. Amazing, amazing. And I'm gonna say with you, Marissa, uh, uh, because um, all of you, all of my panelists have uh, uh, work in order to build uh, an organization or to build a company that will lead this kind of impact and, and create this kind of impact. But at the same time, it could be overwhelming sometimes to uh, uh, lead with an example or lead with uh, this kind of value within your organization. So let's say as a leader uh, in your organization, how did you adapt the idea of giving and the value of giving within your organization? And your team. Very good. So this is a very, very good question. So I'll tackle it in a way that, okay. So there's so many people who approach this from emotional aspect, and they say, okay, you know what? I want to give back. And they really struggle one month, one month or down two months after they made a lot of sacrifices. Like, I cannot sustain this. Mm -hmm. So many NGOs, they just they stop or they cannot do this. So many things that uh, people start giving initiatives. One month, two months down the line, they said, okay, this is a burden. I cannot do this. So, and this is what the unique aspect of looking at it, and this is what the unique aspect of social entrepreneurship, back to that Tom's shoes, you know? Building a sustainable brand that is motivating the shareholders, motivating the stakeholders, motivating the customers, motivating uh, the employees, motivating everyone, having a purpose-driven company as well that you follow in. So, Nomohub as itself, for example, if you look at the competition, there's a company called G Adventures. And this is a travel, sustainable travel company based out in the US. Now, its valuation is around $350 million, oh, wow. and big valuation. And us in the MENA, there is very limited uh, sustainable companies. So back to your question is, 
as a leader, how would you translate this? You have to create a sustainable giving, uh, I would say, business model, similar to the giving movement. You know, how many people are wearing all these giving movements, and they're proud of wearing the giving movements, and they feel they're contributing. Yeah. And the same thing, the giving movements employees are very proud of working the giving movements. The giving movements shareholders are actually happy to invest in this, and not only this, the investors are actually begging to any SDG businesses. Now we live in an era that if you have any SDG driven business or a purpose driven or something that gives back to the communities, you will be shocked that government initiatives and finances will come yeah. to you, anything that will help. So it's really the right opportunity for every one of you guys. And just have, when you come through the giving, be practical approach, see how you can sustain that. And uh, you will be shocked by the amount of uh, help you'll get MISC platform. It's such a, a great enabler platform for such ideas. I'm sure that what any one of you guys who have such an ideas, the platform will offer you the full support to do whatever. So, uh, so yeah, so Amazing. it starts from motivating everyone. Amazing. And, and you mentioned sustainability, and this is in any business model, it should be important. And at the same time, the sustainability of the value, and it's something not with the people, and it's with, within the organization for most of people to understand this, is to see what is the value of the place, not the value of the person. So if the person gone, I mean, it's the value will be gone with, uh, with him or with her. Yeah. So it's very important to embed it, this uh, value within the uh, organization. Yeah. And uh, to you as well, uh, uh, Hadia, uh, you're an industry where uh, profit make uh, everything in it. And it's very important and it's very competitive industry. How do you keep this value within your team and within your organization? Well, I think Matasim said it in a perfect way. So I'll take it back a little bit down a notch. You don't have to be... Uh, the founder or the CEO or businessman, yeah. like I believe that the human being, the value of the human human being in life, is to have a posit positive impact. Yeah. This impact could be so small. For example, you give a compliment to someone you don't know. Like I, I have a routine every day. I wake up, I go have coffee um, in a cafe uh, under the office in the building. So every day I give, I, I have to give a compliment, and it's true. Like I say, I like your hair, I love your eyeliner, I like your, uh, uh, oh, nice perfume, I can smell it, what is it? Every day. And every day I can feel it. Oh, oh, Miss Hadia, how are you? What, the, what can I get you today? No, no, no. So from the smallest thing, giving a smile to someone or giving a compliment to someone, or to the biggest thing, like creating an industry, out of nothing this is but for everyone here start with the smallest thing and it will make you happy mm -hmm. and and then taking it to to like s s one step up same thing like i always make sure that that my my team they're happy like for example i'll give you an idea i have uh, my right arm he's he's been with me in the in, in the company for eight years eight years oh wow eight years he started with me in the cairo office with the salary was in EGP was nothing. Now he's, he's getting a very big, very good salary in UAE. I got him with me to Dubai, so I take care of my people. You started with me, you stay with me. Same thing, I have a designer, he's been with me for nine years, wow. nine years. So, so if you take care of the people, they stay with you and you will have a very strong team. Instead of thinking how can I take from them, mm. think how can I take from them, but also how can I give them so they can stay with me and keep give, giving me. Mm. Yeah. And then think about this from all the partners, not just, not just all the parties within you. So your family, your business partners, uh, for example, uh, this I know it's coming in a different question, <laughs> so I will keep it. But, <laughs> but I mean, like, if you, if you think, from all the things that surround you, to think that I will give them, you will gain because they will want to give you back. Amazing, amazing. And it's, uh, it's very important, uh, uh, and, and you said, to, to limit it down. And it's not just the, the value uh, when it's come to the, the strategy value of the, of the place. It's uh, in your, uh, in your uh, personality, in your uh, way of giving back to the, to the team who are working with you, to share, the, let's, uh, as you said, the, the kind of compliment and the thing, that it's motivate people mm -hmm. to, uh, to make their values very important within the organization. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, to you, Denisha, with the same, uh, let's say, approach or the same question, uh, it's very important to, to keep people motivated in, in order to create this kind of change. So how are you keeping this value and giving back uh, within your team and organization? 
Um, so if I think about the different organizations or people and structures that I work with, I think that it comes back to sustainable practice, right? So sustainable practice is supposed to be reciprocal. So you take um, and you get back, uh, whether it's an environmental practice or a personal practice. And I think I'm fortunate enough, I know different industries are very diff uh, have different challenges, but I think in the environmental space, um, not so much the green economy space, but more in the environmental, the restoration, the ecological work, we have that kind of ethos of when you give, um, you receive, and when you plant something, a tree will grow, it will provide you shade, it might not be in your lifetime, but it, you, you, you plant the seed and, and it's, it's for a vision bigger than you. Yeah. Um, and so I think I'm fortunate enough actually to be surrounded by people, communities, youth, who are interested in the environment and whose minds are actually just shaped by the concepts that you've mentioned, simply because they understand reciprocity and how you know, deeply intertwined that is in the sustainability space and the environmental space. So actually, I have not had to do much work when it comes to generating that kind of culture. If anything, I think I've learned so much from local communities uh, just by changing my approach. Because sometimes people are not naming it as this giving or generosity or reciprocity. They're not naming it as such, but they're doing it. And so I think going into communities, um, going into the schools that I work with, because my team per se is, is, is quite broad. Um, the structure and the board that I work with, we've all got the same culture, the same belief when it comes to giving and receiving um, and, and just the gains that come from that. But I think going, speaking to youth and schools and disadvantaged communities, I've gone in as a visitor, as a listener, as, as, as a student, and I've come out richer. Um, and so there's also, there's also value in that, actually. So sometimes we've got things to, to impart, but we've, we, we can also learn a lot about giving exactly. from the people that we work with. Exactly. And, and, and uh, once it's, it's, uh, you're surrounding yourself with the people who have uh, this kind of value and beliefs, it will, it will show the long impact on, yes. on that. And staying with you, uh, Denisha, that uh, uh, having the same, uh, and, and you work with indigenous people uh, or the community, if, if we're saying it correctly, the... Uh, ripple of effect of giving back and, and, and the ripple of effect of giving back to those community. How did you see it from your point of view after you work in, in building uh, Leave Culture and, and uh, your uh, uh, initiative in the beginning? Yeah. How did you see that ripple of effect on, on the community that you have worked with, on the community who surrounded that? What kind of change that that uh, uh, created for them? Yeah. So also just to say, you know, when I when I mentioned that that personal story and the impact and all the results, I don't want to take all that credit because I think that, yes, I facilitated a lot of it and I might have been guiding the process and motivating for the funds, but it was all community driven. It was wow. all driven by the people from those communities, from those school children. You know, d so many of the schools have done most to of the work. Them in the process. Yes, yeah. and so I, I must say that. And then the ripple effect, right? And so the ripple effect is is literally the impact. Um, I have had to do very, I mean, I've sacrificed a lot and I think I underplay this. You spoke about how much we give and sometimes it's exhausting if you don't yeah. monitor that and that's, you know, the MPO space. Um, and that's me on a daily basis, even though I've got the structures in place, it's just, I think it's my personality. Um, but the ripple effect, I think when, when you are strategic about how you give and you work within a structure that you know is going to have a big impact, that ripple effect is a given. Yeah. Um, and I think I have just affirmed the pre-existing ideas that indigenous local communities already have about giving and about investment into their own space. And I think I've just affirmed it. Um, through my company, through the work that I do, just through my presence, the projects that I come in to facilitate, I just affirm that. Yeah. And I think just by affirming what people already know, affirming belief systems, affirming values and principles, will have a massive impact. So you don't necessarily have to come in and impose.
difference, yeah, you yeah. know? So I come in as, um, you know, I'll get paid to come in as a mediator or facilitator between various stakeholders, but I don't need to impose anything. If anything, I just ask questions and people answer the questions themselves. Um, and I ask the questions, they start asking more questions and they start answering their own questions. So I think not imposing sometimes has a bigger ripple effect um, and just that balance yeah. um, of leaning into what people already know and just affirming um, their own value systems, especially I, indigenous and local people. Yeah. I agree, and, 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 and it's, it's the value of it by including them from the beginning of the start. Yes. So sometimes when you work with an NGOs or like we're MBOs, uh, uh, it started from, uh, let's say, uh, up to down, where yeah. you will create this from up to down, but it's very important to include them in the process and make sure that uh, it's changed by them that will uh, affect yes. the, uh, the, the community that you're working with. Yeah. Uh, going back to you, Hadia, uh, the ripple effect, uh, like we said, it's a social challenge. However, uh, it's very important to see how does that affect the long-term process uh, for you. So I will, I will speak from a very concrete point of view, like mainly business now. Yeah. So before, before, the, before I started the brand, you had... You had what? You had shoes, you had bags, you had pants, you had blazers, you had shirts, t-shirts, but you didn't really have burkini. Yeah. It was a taboo. It was a product that was everyone was so scared of approaching and it wasn't even on their radar. They didn't even think about it. Yeah. So I remember in, in 2020 when I, um, when I started the brand in April 2020, I was the only one. I had z z zero competition. I was the only, only one. And in 2023, suddenly there are a hundred brands doing oh, wow. burkinis. So, so wow. from one idea, from from helping just one segment, I op I don't like to say I, but I mean we opened it opened up, yeah, it's a great. new market. We literally opened a new market for new brands, for a new industry, I agree. for for new people to have jobs, for new people to have. Uh, to sell, to, to, to make revenue, to, make, to, ha to give salaries. So for me, this was the main ripple effect that a new market opened. Amazing. Just a new market opened. Mm. And not only, like, you won't believe, like, for example, I got approached by, one of the, by some of the biggest factories in Italy. They, do, they, they, they produce for... Um, they produce for Nike, for Lululemon, for even Skims. Yeah. Like, they're the ones who approached us, telling us, we, we've seen your work, can we please produce for you? And I went to, I went to Milan and I had the meeting with them and, and, I, and, he, and I, I started the meeting, I told him, I do this, I do that, I do this. He's like, no, no, I know everything about you. You don't have to tell me anything. Yeah. So tell me, how many pieces do you need? What is the material you need? I'm like, stuff like that. So wow. like a brand, one-year-old one brand from an Egyptian girl in, living in Dubai, caught the radar of the producers of huge, huge factories in, 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 in Italy. This is to show you that the ripple effect, we can actually, us in the Arab world, if we really look mm. at our needs, if we really look at what we want to have for our own society, we can actually, they can look up to us, not the only way, the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Amazing, and, and, and it shows us, uh, and made us, and even for the audience, to think about what exactly uh, uh, do we need when it's come to think about, about the business. And uh, uh, this is a very challenging idea because uh, at the same time, uh, you're talking about business. So uh, your uh, North Star is profit, and you need to make a profit in order to sustain that. But understanding that uh, how can I combine this with a good quality, and how can I combine what, I, what is actually a social need with a combined good quality, that will lead you to where you are. So it's very, very, very important to, to let's say, look at it 360 so it, to make you understand uh, how do you want to make this kind of, uh, kind of change. I'm, I'm a very, I'm a person driven by numbers. <laughs> so for me, if I can do a ripple effect with numbers, mm. this is the best thing. And that's what happened. You, you create your own competition with, uh, with yes. different fronts. Mm. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, going to, uh, to you, Matasim, uh, about the ripple effect. And, uh, uh, and as, we, uh, as we mentioned uh, before, that it's, uh, it's very important to see how that changed the ecosystem uh, uh, for, for the industry. And, and talking about tourism, this, it's very important to understand 
does that affect uh, 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 the whole idea about how, why do we travel and why do we have to book a flight and then travel and find a suitable place to sit and enjoy the place? How has that uh, created that effect? Uh, fantastic. Thank you for the question. So, uh, so if you go to Numo Hub, we have a slogan of, uh, and this is what we really believe in. Our slogan says, uh, travel with a purpose. And if you want to define purpose, is really uh, uh, the meaning behind everything. So why do wanna we travel if I'm going to travel to live in a five-star luxury hotel by myself for one week where I gained nothing, I contributed nothing. Maybe I've gained a bit of wellness if you're actually not alone, but if you're alone, you gained a bit more, uh, more stress. It could be worse. But uh, yeah, uh, or, uh, but uh, so yeah, to put it back in uh, the ripple effect is as a Numo Hub, we have almost 10% to 15% of our revenues goes into donations. Uh, and these donations have contributed uh, in a lot of things uh, uh, across uh, different sectors. But one of the most important thing we have seen is uh, you're always going to see impact. People will take about, okay, I did that. This, this is an impact, this is an impact, this is an impact. But if we dig deep, there is very few are actually real impacts. And this is unsustainable impacts. And this is the most important thing aspect of it as well. How to make that impact is a real impact, is a sustainable impact. And uh, what we do in our uh, uh, the company is we focus on education. Mm -hmm. And we focus on building schools. And education is the first pillar of generational uh, changes. Uh, we have built, uh, we have gave access to more than 10,000 kids to have access to school, uh, underprivileged kids, for primary schools only. I'm not talking even middle schools. There's so many kids, they can't even go to schools at the beginning. So, the, and I'm talking about too many uh, countries, whether in Zanzibar or Morocco and uh, Sri Lanka. And so the ripple effect is, we focus on education, and we believe education is where everything starts. Mm. Uh, education is a generational change, and those kids, they will have a profound impact later on with something else, and those kids, so it's, the impact will just carry itself mm. along and along, and what we believe the Numo Hub is education is the first pillar. So this is where I'm seeing is, uh, what is the ripple effect. The second ripple effect is the cultural awareness. And if you look at the title here, pursuing, the big picture, yeah, and cultural diversity and identity. And now when we talk about DNI, DNI in every corporate, and it's a big measure that across different governments, different corporates, uh, and maybe it's a buzzword that we just notice it now, mm -hmm. right? But if you go back in the picture, is this DNI metric came from day one. It's written in the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَالًا لِتَعَارَفُ Right? It's, it's, it's the first pillars in our religion, and it's, it's the right thing that opens your mind for so many things. And this is where I believe is uh, the ripple effects in diversities when people travel, open their, culture, open their eyes to different cultures, MISC global prof, uh, forum as well, having people from different nationalities, different way of thinking, different mentalities. All this has its own ripple effect within you and as well, again, within the societies around you. So uh, I would say both this is where like Numuhab fits in our donations as well as in our travel and big pictures is like where we try to open the customers to the world, yeah. Amazing, and, 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 and as you said, this is, uh, since we're talking about DNI, that it's very important uh, uh, to look at it, it's with a purpose. That is something that you're gonna meet people and introduce your culture and gain a different culture of different understanding from people, different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 approach to life uh, uh, from integrating with those people. So as you said, that it's, it, it will change that kind of effect on people, how they travel and how they approach traveling in, in general. And I believe maybe you people travel in December, so this is a good opportunity to try something new. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, same with you, uh, uh, Muatazim. Uh, and again, since we're talking about the big picture, we don't want to uh, look at it just from that uh, 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 level of effect on, on communities or uh, on countries, if I may say. But at the same time, how does that uh, game back to you uh, and your well-being? How do you see it and how that, uh, the idea of giving and the mindset of giving uh, contribute to your well-being and, and how do you uh, understand that within yourself to uh, have a, this sustained life and understanding the well-being more uh, uh, by just giving? Okay, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for uh, the question. So giving, uh, I'll say, okay, I'll give you just a quick study, a Harvard study. I'm sure people always know about Harvard Business School. They always give uh, uh, statistics about uh, 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 about how companies should operate in this, and they say that companies that don't have a purpose-driven uh, goals actually they struggle 
to retain their talents. A lot of people live, and we live in a society at the moment, especially at our age. I'm talking about in t between 2000. Uh, this, this level of society is where the social media is opening up. A lot of people, and we're talking about the age between 20 to 35, so the millennials generation or, what, or the one up and downs of it, they always start to question themselves, what is my purpose of working in this job, right? This is the first thing I'm seeing. A lot of people, like, they are trying to look for a career shift at the moment, saying, I'm not seeing a value of my job. Like, I'm not, I'm not seeing an impact. And this is, I'm not talking, it's not about the small companies. I'm talking about even the big corporation. So many people have left big industries, just they are not seeing the value of what they're doing on a daily basis. So, and this contributes to their wellness uh, at the same time. Uh, and they have re realized, actually, companies, uh, the back to the study, they have realized companies who impose purpose-driven goals, not only a profit, okay, mm. and they have looked at the long-term solutions because all this purpose will give you in the long term, it's not a short term. And back to the big picture as well, he's pursuing yeah. the big picture. The big picture is the long term. Yeah. And this is where you start applying the purpose-driven goals. And this is where you start retaining your talents as well. This is where you start, the employees will become better well-beings. People will have better purpose in their lives. And people are looking at meaningful, meaningful things. Uh, money is not really the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Yet money will give you the fundamentals, uh, yeah. but after all, it's a materialistic thing. Mm. It will not give you the satisfactions you need. Mm. Giving will absolutely give you the satisfactions you need. And, uh, and yeah, so uh, how does that affect? I'm saying, I say giving is a fundamental uh, aspect in everyone's well-being. And a lot of people, when they go through hardship, they really start questioning uh, a lot of things. And the first thing this, that comes to their mind or a solution has always been at the giving. And whether it's companies, individuals, initiatives, Amazing. whatever it is. And people are actually motivated to work in such environments, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more because uh, uh, and we always hear the saying that it's, uh, if you want to start to make yourself happy, start by making somebody else happy. And this is will contribute to your own Absolutely. happiness and Absolutely. your own uh, well-being. So this is very, very important. And to you, uh, Hadi, how does that affect your well-being? So I will, I will give my state before and after. All right. So before, so let's say that the, that the point of, of change was me building the brand and helping my fan base, my customers, my, my Arab fellow women. So before it, what was I doing? I was, I was, I was um, managing, I had a marketing agency, so... I get, I get a brand, they give me money, I get them influencers. Uh, this is a very nice blush, this is a very nice lipstick, uh, this is very nice for the hair, no purpose. Uh, and I was an influencer, I, okay. And how, what, what was my mental state back then? I was depressed, I was not happy, even though I was making money, mm. I was famous. Even though I was famous, I was depressed. And I was bullied a lot. Mm. I was like, the main consensus around me is that I'm shallow, I'm, um, I'm stupid. I take my parents' money and I spend it they, because they don't know that I had, an, like, they don't want to listen to what I do. <laughs> they just have their prejudice. Yeah, yeah. So from all points of view, I was not happy. Mm. Okay, now fast forward, I made the brand and then something changed. Mm. What changed is the way I look at what I do. Mm. So, so, so before, all I was doing was promoting other products mm. and getting a fee for this promotion and this those products i don't know if they help or they don't help mm. i don't know anything but now that every day i go to the office and i know that i'm doing a product and this product i'm not i'm prom i'm producing it and i'm promoting it and i'm selling it for women to help them with their confidence to help them with their with their presence in some sort of way it changes everything. So even now, that's from my inner point of view. Mm. From the outer point of view, how people see me, they completely change. Like if you ask them, tell us about Hadzia Ghalib in 2020 and tell us about Hadzia Ghalib in 2023, they will tell you we completely changed how we, how we think of her. Wow. She's, not, she's not that stupid. <laughs> she's not that shallow. She actually, she thinks a little bit. So, so even the people see, see it. They, they appreciate the value if you give them value and they, they see it. Mm. And even, I still get bullied. Go, go on my TikTok, all, my, all the comments are like, uh, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> even like from all Arabic languages, the, all dialects, I'm getting bullied. You can get many <laughs> accents. But, but I'm like, mm, it's okay. Uh, 
I, I, I'm still proud of myself. I don't care what they say. I don't care if they think that my style is stupid or if I'm too eccentric. It's fine. I know that. I helped 10,000 girls who bought my mm. swimsuits. Amazing, amazing. And, and, uh, yeah, uh, for, I forgot something. Sure. And I stopped. So I, I was depressed. I was taking medication for my depression uh, and anxiety. Now I'm, I'm, I'm on a plan to stop it. Nice. So this wow. was because of the brand. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> This is a, a, a real example for yeah. when we talk about change and talk about well-being and understanding mm -hmm. that. This is a real example of uh, how you move from one point or one stage to a better uh, uh, stage, alhamdulillah, which is, and we're happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to see uh, the idea of giving, how does it uh, affect and how does it uh, reflect on, 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 on a personal level. So uh, a lot of people might see it from a different angle. I say, yeah, Hadi, she's, her life is amazing and she's doing amazing and all of that, but they don't know what the real struggle behind this. So uh, I really applaud you for that. And, and this is an amazing, amazing uh, work. To you, Denisha, yes. uh, I think uh, 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 environment by itself, it's a, a very good way for well-being. Yes. But how does that kind of work affect your well-being? So uh, I think similar to yours, I, I, come, I come from an industry that was extremely extractive, very depressing to work within frameworks that were not reflecting my value systems or my principles um, and just did not align with me. And I think making that shift and creating my own platform and creating my own culture, which is leave culture, um, has helped a lot with m my own wellness and my own well-being. I also have a wellness coach. So I have a coach that um, I check in with every two weeks, and this is for personal development, for professional development. I highly recommend this. Um, it's just it's, it's a good soundboard. It's someone that can give you tools, and this has helped me a lot. I think... Um, with a lot of us who are doing purpose-driven work, depression, anxiety comes along with us. And so I share the same sentiments with you needing to be medicated, needing to go off medication because it's just not, it's not sustainable. Um, and so how do you get off medication? I think it's all linked to purpose. It's all linked to shaping a lifestyle uh, around your values, your religion, your culture plays a huge role in keeping you grounded, in keeping you healthy. I mean, if we look at our religions, our cultural practices, there's so much there that can just keep us mentally strong, physically strong. And as I get older, I see more value in that. And I am fortunate enough to build an entire business around a value system and, and around healthy principles, all linked to my culture, all linked to religion. Um, and this is a choice that I'm making. And so I think that, um, that, 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 that helps. And even in the environmental space, I mean, it can be extremely um, violent. It can be a very violent space, oh, wow. very extractive, you know, very political as well. Yeah. Um, and so you need to put the mechanisms in place to take care of yourself. Uh, as you grow as, as a professional, as a person, just as a human being. Um, the world is changing. There are so many demands uh, on all of us. We're being bombarded by you know, different ways of existing. Um, the world's changing. Um, and so we need to have mechanisms in place to support ourselves. And also family. You know, family plays such a huge role yeah. um, in keeping you healthy. A lot of us become isolated, you know, thinking that independence um, is about becoming isolated. You know, it's, it's just about you. It's about buying the house, the car, starting the family away from your, your you know, your core family. And, and Actually, it's, it's, as I get older, I realize it's not about that. It's about yeah. keeping the unit together. It's about going back to them for support. Uh, it's about the comfort from your mother, you know, the, the sounding board from your father. It's, those are so important and uh, are helping me so much as I get older and, and, yeah, trying to establish a culture that is meaningful and healthy and also trying to model that to other people and, and youth in particular. Amazing, amazing, and I think this is uh, uh, this is shows uh, how do we build this ecosystem of yes. our well-being when it's come to our family, when it's come to our uh, daily life routine and, and our work. Uh, I think we have to come to a conclusion. Yes. So thank you so much, uh, my amazing panelists, and we let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh,
I believe that we have uh, shown uh, what is the big picture from a different angle, different point of view when it's come to our life, when it's come to our work, and when it's come to uh, even our purpose in life. So it's it's very important to understand it from a different angle, and nobody's uh, oh, yeah, he deserve more uh, to be uh, addressed at this point by uh, Denisha, Hadia, and Mu'tasim. I would like to thank you thank for joining you. us today uh, in this panel discussion. So. It's time for you guys to think more about your, your big picture and to pursue your big picture and understand more about your life. And I wish you nothing but the best and to enjoy uh, uh, Miss Global Forum at the last day, unfortunately. So thank you so much. Thank you.